All right. Welcome to the newest episode of the Kentucky Elk Hunt webinar series. Uh, John Hash is out on a much needed vacation, so I'm going to do my best to try to uh, uh, host this show um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But a few quick housekeeping notes. The, uh, the secondary regulated area elk hunting unit drawing uh, just recently completed uh, earlier this week. Uh, that would have been on Tuesday, the 13th of July. So if you guys haven't already, log into your my profile and see what uh, what area you were selected for. Um, on the same note, we're currently getting getting a lot of calls and emails from anxious elk hunters. So uh, please bear with us if we don't get back to you right away. Um, and I've, I've been asked already several times, but we are trying to compile this year's area selection data and uh, some other summary statistics for you guys to view. And um, if you didn't get the exact area you wanted um it's not the end of the world we can talk to you try to offer some advice uh, just like every other episode we're going to have all of our contact information up at the end of the um the presentation and there's also a uh, leftover drawing on august 9th where we can pick up uh any remaining regulated area spots that are that are not currently filled um and we'll we'll do a video or something along the way to kind of describe the process but um that's, uh, that's the quick housekeeping notes. Um, but today we've got three of our Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Law Enforcement officers with us to talk to you guys uh, about different elk hunting regulations and, and ways that you can um, stay legal in the elk woods. Um, our primary goal is just, again, to let them um, kind of let you know what's, uh, what's legal and what's not and uh, provide some, some input to you all to... Uh, Try to keep you legal and safe and, and have a good successful hunt this fall so um, we'll go ahead and start with introductions uh first uh homer would you like to introduce yourself so i'm uh, sergeant pigman i'm out of the uh Ledger county area i pretty well uh cover uh that southeastern corner of the state uh, so. all right uh robbie Sergeant Robbie Spears, uh, I currently mostly work Pike County, but uh, elk season, you, you'll find me more in the Pike Martin area. Um, that's kind of my little section of far east there. Okay. And then we've also got uh, Glenn Griffey with us. My name's Glenn Griffey. I'm the Perry County Game Warden. Um, Kings I've already covered during elk season. Just like Robbie said, it could be Pike or Martin, but normally it's not County, Perry County, Breathitt County. Okay. Those areas around, uh, maybe even Letcher County. Well, guys, we're uh, I, I can't tell you much how uh, tell you enough how much I appreciate y'all jumping in here to talk to us today. So I'm um, I'll probably just turn it over to you guys and let you talk to the elk hunters and um, let them know what uh, what what it is that you want them to know. Absolutely, and we appreciate you having us on. And and this is our first opportunity to get to talk to elk hunters before elk season that we've really ever had. So hopefully it goes well. Hopefully we can get out some um, some common questions that we get. Maybe you know help you not to have them questions later, and, uh, and and cover some common elk hunting violations that we see that uh, sometimes happen by accident or, or maybe just because uh, wasn't prepared enough in the hunting guide. So I'd like to start uh, just by saying you know we can't cover everything today. So if you're watching this, don't let this be your only option that you use on trying to make sure that you're legal you know get your hunting guide uh we're going to include a link to that um in the youtube video uh, underneath um go you you can also go if you want to take a step farther to our kentucky administrative regulations uh he's going to put a link in that as well uh go to those read them make you make sure you're familiar with them uh something else if you've been drawn before uh our elk regulations they change yearly so just because you was drawn five years ago or because you assisted a hunter even two, three years ago or last year doesn't mean that something hasn't changed. So take the time, go in there, make sure that, that you know what you're doing before you go to the woods because ultimately it's the hunter's responsibility to make sure they're legal. Uh, you know, just because you got a guide or because you know somebody from the area that's going to try to help you, you know, it's going to come down to the hunter you as a hunter going in and making sure that you're legal. So just remember, we're gonna cover some stuff. It'll be fairly broad, but you need to really dive into that and, and do some research yourself as well. Y'all have anything you wanna to add to that before we go on? Nope. Okay. So we're gonna start um, 
we kind of broke it down in sections. Uh, we'll start with some of the archery and the crossbow uh, regulations that we have and kind of what, you know, questions we get a lot. First off, we get a lot of questions on a, a poundage requirement for either the um, a bow or crossbow. There is no poundage requirement in Kentucky, nothing to worry about there. Uh, when it comes to broadheads, uh, they must be seven eighths of an inch wide after expansion uh, and they can't be chemically treated. Uh, another big thing, crossbows, you gotta have a working safety on them. Make sure that's good. Uh, lighted knocks, they are okay, uh, no issues there. Uh, you may use archery equipment during firearm season, but all your archery, archery regulations are still gonna apply. Uh, we get that question a lot to where if I'm gonna use, you know, some archery equipment during rifle season, am I okay to do it? Yes, you are. And the next question is, well, does, this, does the archery regulations still apply? Yes, they still all apply, same thing. If you're using it, you gotta go with it. Uh, the big thing on the archery that I wanna cover, and it's not so much regulation, is just making sure you're prepared before you get to the woods. Uh, you know, two days before your archery elk season starts, it's probably not a good day to get a new bow and decide to go out there, and that's what that's the equipment you're going to use. Um, we've ran into hunters that have done that, and, you know, you start worrying about, like, wounding elk, and, and that's not what we want. Uh, just make sure that, you know, you're efficient with it. Make sure you're practicing with it. Um, I ran into elk hunter once that literally – the day before he was archery elk hunting, he decided to buy a bow because he had an archery tag. And he was mad because the end of the season because he hadn't harvested an elk. And, you know, I started talking to him, well, you know, probably long before the day before archery elk season, if you've got an archery tag, would be a time to start making sure you're efficient, even scouting, doing some other work. So that, that's my big thing on that is just make sure you're getting out, make sure you're efficient with your equipment, make sure it is legal and, uh, Honestly, our elk herd is, is so great. Everything else should take care of itself. John, anything you want to add to that? Just mainly, honestly, with archery as well, these are big animals. So when you shoot one, if it don't, I guess it really goes more with firearms as well too, but if it don't fall down, don't think you didn't kill the animal. Give the, time, give the animal plenty, ample amount of time, you know, to pass, and then go try to recover the animal. Don't try to push it off quick with archery. If anybody's deer hunting with archery, you know how it is. Give them ample amount of time to go ahead and pass before you start uh, searching for them. Yeah, and to add to that, a lot of this uh, on these strip jobs, um, blood trailing across the top of them, it, it's not really hay. I don't know what you call that, like sage grass or, or whatever it is. It's really hard in that September, October, November to, to blood trail across that. So you know, try to watch where it goes. Uh, it may be better if you can find it when picking it up over the bank. Um, just because you're not seeing blood on top, it's really hard on these strip jobs if you've never been around them to track a elk. I'll pass it on to Sergeant Pigman. Uh, some uh, general requirements uh, for the hunter uh, who is hunting with a firearm. Uh, you must comply with the hunter orange requirement, uh, same as you would during the deer season. So. Uh, you got to have a hat. You got to have a hunter orange vest on if you're out there. If you're in a blind, you must have 144 inches of orange visible from 360 degrees. So if you got you're sitting in a blind, you need to be able to uh, have some kind of orange on it or something to identify yourself out in the field, uh, because we do have a lot of hunters out there. Uh, a minimum caliber size is uh, for a rifle is a 270. Um, we don't really see anybody, but uh, we've had one or two cases where we've had some people with six millimeters and things like that. And that's under the uh, under the uh, uh, range of what you can use. So you wanna make sure it's at least a 270. And, and, and we have that just because it's an ethical uh, round. It's got enough energy and everything to bring that elk down. But uh, I wanna remind you too, that uh, uh, we've had instances where people have caught them with 270s and didn't immediately bring them to the ground. So uh, when, you, uh, when that occurs, you, know, you wanna make sure that you, you, uh, you harvest that animal and uh, don't go out and try to shoot another. Uh, try to make sure that uh, you give it a sufficient time to, uh, to uh, fall to the ground and stuff. So, uh, and another thing too is when you're shooting at an elk, uh, if you're using your 270 or something, uh, make sure that you're shooting at that one elk. Don't, uh, don't shoot into a crowd of elk or anything like that uh, because sometimes we've had instances where uh, two or three elk have been killed. Uh, 
As far as the muzzle loader, it must be at least a 50 caliber uh, shotgun. Uh, hey, Homer. Well, large plug. Can I chime in real quick? I, we're kind of having a hard time hearing you. Um, can you either speak up or uh, be a little bit closer to your... Okay. Yeah, we might have uh, some problems with some uh, bleed over from the other. Let me move into the other room here real quick. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's, I think uh, that's what's going on. It's and good and information. Why, <laughs> I don't want to know. Why he's moving, I want to go ahead and just jump back while he's moving. Um, with that hunter orange requirement, that's everybody in the party. That is a common violation we see to where, you know, they may see it on a hunting show from a different state where we see one, just a hunter have orange on. If you're assisting the hunter, if you're in that party, everybody's got to meet the hunter uh, orange requirements. Go ahead, Homer. Okay. Uh, we talked about the shotguns there a minute ago. So uh, a minimum of a 20 gauge shotgun with a, with a slug. Um, handguns with a 1.285 case. I think like a 44 caliber, that doesn't meet the qualification, even though that's a pretty big round. Uh, the case size is not long enough. Um, or 270 or larger or any legal archery or crossbow equipment and uh, must uh, must not have a magazine that uh, can hold more than 10 rounds. So that's the same thing that we have on a, on a deer and stuff. And it must be, uh, cannot be fully automatic and it, uh, you cannot have a full metal jacket ammunition or tracer ammunition. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Um, just to, to make sure that we cover it and uh, make sure I'm understanding correctly. So, uh, uh, somebody who's drawn for firearms, bull tag or cow tag, they can still use the legal, any legal archery or crossbow equipment, right? But they must also, even though they're archery hunting, they still have to comply with the hunter orange requirements, right? Yes. So if they're, if they decide they, uh, they've been drawn for a, uh, say a gun hunt and they want to, they, they, they would prefer to take it with archery during that gun season. Yes. They would have to comply with the hunter orange regulation because there is a firearm season in progress at that time. Okay. Alrighty, guys, uh, just uh, some general elk hunter uh, requirements. Um, when you get your permit, if depend on which uh, what you're drawn for, if you're drawn for your bull firearm or cow firearm or archery, we have uh, designated permits for them as well. Each permit is only good for one elk, so just make sure we, whichever one you are drawn for, you go and get the proper permit for it. Um, once you get your permit, some more uh, requirements are you got to have your annual hunt license unless you're a license exempt. Um, and then you got to have your elk permit. And once you buy your elk permit, that's when you'll be able to print off your elk hang tag. Uh, I don't know exactly the link. Joe uh, can go into more details exactly where the link will be to print off the elk hang tag. Once you print that off, when you're out in the field, you need to have that hanging on your mirror. If it falls off on your dash, we understand stuff like that happens. Uh, as long as we can physically see it hanging on your mirror or on your dash, uh, you'll be fine there. You're, uh, if you was born after January, January 1st, 1975, you're required to have your hunter education card. Um, that's That goes for anybody. Uh, but we do offer, if you don't have that, you don't have time to acquire your hunter education card, we have a one-year exemption. If you've never used that before, that'll cover you from the day you purchase it to the following year at the same time. You'll go through it, ask you a few questions, uh, roughly five to 10 questions. Once you uh, complete that, you'll be able to print off your exemption form you need to maintain all these on your person while you're out in the field. Uh, if you're not licensed exempt, you need to have your hunting license, your elk permit, and your uh, hunter ed, uh, card or exempt, exemption to provide it to a game warden if one of us approach you and uh, you know ask for them. Uh, if you aren't su successful in harvesting the animal, once you uh, locate your animal, uh, before moving it, you need to record it on your harvest log on the back of it. That's just simple date, uh, the county it's killed in, the six. Um, and um, after that, you know, before moving it, or actually, I'm, I misspoke, but before midnight of the day you've harvested or uh, recovered the animal, you need a telecheck at in. Once you get your telecheck number, you'll put it on the back of your harvest log, and that'll complete your harvest log requirements. Uh, if you're if for some reason these are large animals, we understand that. So we know some people might have to quarter these animals up in the field. If you do um, quarter them up, you need to maintain a proof of sex on it, either by keeping its head or keeping its genitalia and attached to the carcass. And all that is, 
like I said, if it's a bull elk, keeping his head and antlers where we can visibly see that it is an antlered animal is all you need to uh, fulfill that requirement. And if you take it to a processor or a taxidermist, you'll need to make sure you fill out a carcass tag. Um, the carcass tag, you'll need to have your, hundred, your name on it, your phone number, and a fill check confirmation number. If you, for some odd reason, can't remember this information, you know, this, that, the carcass tag requirements on, is on page seven in your hunting manual. And the, as far as quartering up, it'll go over it on page 18 in the elk section. Um, and the last thing, um, you're going to assign each unit, you know, uh, two through seven, whichever unit you are assigned, you have to hunt within that unit. You can't switch over unless you have private, I mean, you own property in another zone. So if you're assigned unit seven and you have private, pro I mean, you're, you own property in unit four, you can hunt that property, but that's the only exception we have to that. Um, so, and the regulated areas as well. If you're a draw for a regulated area inside of one of them uh, units, you can hunt that regulated area plus the full unit itself. Um, and just for one of the main things, um, if you're 15 years of age or younger, you, you have to have a adult with you at all times. So just remember that, and, uh, you know, that person uh, accompanying you don't have to have a hunting license, but they do if it's firearm season, you will have to have, as we stated before, all your hunter orange on. Everybody in the party will have to have their hunter orange on it uh, while you're out in the field uh, hunting. I, uh, you guys care if I ask a quick question? Um, it's one that I get all the time and I'm, I wasn't really sure how to answer it. It's about the, uh, the harvest log. So, you know, we are in a, a digital world right now. Let's say I, I killed my elk, I watched it drop, I'm on top of a mountain and I magically have cell service, right? What if I, can I telecheck that animal right there on the spot? And if it's telecheck, does that meet the harvest log requirement? I mean, how does, how does that work? Can you all explain that to me? Because I've actually got that question uh, yesterday. Go ahead, Sergeant Spears, if you want to. Okay, uh, on the, you, you still would have to fill out your hunter harvest log, even if like you can't bypass it and just put a confirmation number on there. So still affix to your license on that hunter harvest log or however you, you know, choose to carry it you would have to have all the information that you would normally have to have prior to telechecking it, even if you go ahead and telecheck. Okay. Anything else? That was, uh, that was the biggest question I had, but I, uh, I did have another one um, briefly about this, uh, the, the carcass tag. Um, you know, you all did a pretty good job explaining it, but I, I've seen this one personally quite a bit too. Um, you know, a lot of guys, if they're, if they're going with an outfitter, if they have a local or a family member, somebody that's going to be driving towards a processor, right? Like they have to put this carcass tag with their information on there if it leaves their possession at all, right? It's not just if you physically drop it off at the check station. If it leaves your possession, it's with someone else. You have to have that tag, right? Yes. Once you leaves your possession, it has to have that carcass tag attached to it. Yes. So if we come up and we, uh, some odd reason we have a uh, probable cause to stop them uh, or if they get stopped by another officer, and they call us out, we can come up and see this animal was harvested by this person. This is his number, this tele telecheck confirmation. We'll go back and, you know, check everything, make sure that it is legit and it is a legal animal. Sure. Um, but yes, it, once it leaves your possession uh, at any time, you have to have a carcass tag attached to that. All right, so we'll, if that's all, we'll move on to the um, some of the common elk hunting violations we see. Everything to this point, um, if you get in your hunting guide and you read it, it, it's fairly cut and dry, pretty easy to follow. And some of this stuff is, is just common elk hunting violations we see, whether it be uh, excitement, you know, hunting. If you've never hunted an elk, it's totally different than hunting a deer. I mean, it, you, you know, there's going to be different emotions there. So just some things to keep in mind. But uh, we'll get started with some common elk hunting violation. It is one big one is just not having the proper paperwork. Uh, whether it be the hang tag uh, Officer Griffey talked about, or uh, the light, or your license, or your hunter education card, you know, just making sure you have all that information with you. Um, you know, and if you can have all that information kind of located before you're in the woods when you do get checked, because you you probably are going to get checked elk hunting. You know, you can you can take that check down from a thirty second check 
you know, it might be a 10 minute check if you're having to dig and, and look for that information. So kind of keep it accessible and, and make things a little quicker for you if you're wanting to get back in the Elkwoods quicker. So, um, uh, so on the, the tag, just make sure you have the tag, make sure it's uh, in the window. Uh, another common violation we see is trespassing. Uh, and that sounds kind of, it may, it may even sound silly to you, like, I'm not going to trespass. Well, the thing about the elk season is, is there's a lot of counties, there's a lot of um, areas you can hunt. So, for example, in Pike County, you may be the R8, you may be on the RH group. Well, they may have land that's in zone six, and they may have land that's zone seven. So, just because you're Drew for RH group, you know, you got to make sure you're in the, the the right elk zone when you're hunting, as he talked about earlier. You know, we see that where people are getting confused and they're like, well, I'm supposed to be on this group. And yet, like, yeah, you are, but you're supposed to be in zone seven on that group and you're sitting in zone six on that group. So uh, just really make sure you, you know um, where you're at. Uh, if, especially if you're hunting private property, uh, it's always, it, it's not required, but it, you know, if you want to get written permission, it always makes things much easier. You know, having contact information uh, for the property owner. Um, really go in, use these apps that they've talked about in other webinars or uh, Onyx. Know the boundaries, know where you're at. Um, good time to learn that is is preseason scouting. You know, know where you're going to be, know the boundaries before you get up there. Uh, we see hunters that show up in the opening morning and they're trying to find boundaries before daylight, and, and that's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, so you got to prepare for this. Um, one thing we do see a lot of is shooting spikes during cow season. And when I, when I say that, to, when hunters call me and they're asking about common uh, violations, they're like, I would never shoot a cow during spike season or a spike during cow season. But what happens is you, you'll have these, these herd of elk. And if you're not really paying attention, it is very common to walk up to an animal you just harvest and realize it's got four to 12 inches of, of, of horn. And, you know, the next call is going to be to us or, or if you're with a, I mean, we even see hunting guides where it happens and they call us and they're like, hey, I know it's cow season. We just harvested a, a spike elk. So you really, especially, you know, during that uh, cow season, make sure of your target, make sure, look, look at that head over. Uh, if you've got any polished horns up there, just know that's going to be a spike and not a cow. Uh, another thing pretty uh, common we see is people that's herd shooting, and a lot of times this is cow season as well, where there might be a large herd of elk. Let's say there's 20 elk out there, and they've got their, their spotter or whoever's helping them is looking at one elk. They're looking at a different elk in the scope, and they're trying to figure out which one they're looking at. They pull the trigger. The hunter's I believe I hit it, and his spotter says, no, you, you didn't hit it. There's nothing. Nothing flinched. Well, then he shoots again. And next thing you know, you walk over there and you got two cows down. So that is, that's pretty common. We, we see both of those a lot. Um, that's our biggest, that and some trespassing issues is our three biggest uh, that I see um, elk violations that, you know, are pretty serious. You know, you start shooting uh, a bull during cow season or shooting two cows, you know, that's pretty serious. So um, just keep that in mind. Think about that when you're hunting. Some other things to consider, um, you know, an elk, you know, you can't shoot it while it's swimming. Um, and, and it's kind of rolls over to your regular deer hunting uh, regulations. You know, you can't take it from a vehicle, a boat. You can't take it from horseback. Um, there's some exemptions to that, but just remember, uh, you're still hunting these, these animals kind of like you would deer. You can't be in a vehicle. Uh, so just know what you're shooting at. Uh, it's good to have a spotter. Make sure that you're all looking at the same animal before you do try to harvest it or shoot at it um, and know where you're at. And, and that'll cover most of them common elk violations. Anybody got anything you want to add to that before I turn it over to Griffey to, to um, add some more common elk hunt violations? I do have a question about the hang tag sure. uh, that I've received from several hunters. Uh, so it's supposed to be in the vehicle that they're hunting with, right? So it would be in their mm -hmm. truck. What if they're hunting from a side by side, using that to get, you know, when they're, they drive a truck with a trailer and a side by side on it, do they need to have one in their side by side as well? 
So here, here, I've had that question, and this is what I've told people, and it's one really good in the past, is they'll call me and they'll be like, I got one hang tag, and I'm going to be on my side by side, but my truck's going to be on the property. There's nothing to say, make a copy of, it. you know, it's going to be easier for you in the long run just to have a copy on both. And then there's going to be no question asked and there's not going to be a game warden more than likely sitting at one or the other waiting on you when you get back to your vehicle. Uh, but now I will let them, you know, uh, have their uh, say on it as well. But for me, you know, that the hang tag is supposed to be in a vehicle. So if you only had one, I would leave it in the vehicle. I agree to it. Same way, you know, if you, best to make uh, extra copies, um, but same with certain spears, I would leave it in the vehicle. But with that being said, too, I'll go ahead and start on some more uh, common uh, violations we come across. Um, I kind of addressed this a little bit with uh, earlier with the har harvest log. Uh, you're not getting the proper um, things on your harvest log, not feeling it out properly or not feeling it out at all. Just remember, uh, once you recovered the animal once you've found the animal after you've shot it um, before you move it you have to fill out the harvest log like i stated before that is the date the species the sex and the county it's been killed in um that's all you got to fill out in the field part but once you get to the house before midnight of the day you recovered the animal you have to telecheck it and that completes the harvest log itself so just remember just because you fill out the four things on the harvest log out in the field you still have to telecheck it in by calling, uh, calling it in and getting the confirmation number and uh, filling it out on the back. And one of, I don't want to say it's a big issue, but like Sergeant uh, Pigman said earlier, we've came across this a few times, you know, with our legal calibers. Uh, we've had people ask about 243s and uh, 6.5 Creedmoors and stuff. That's under the size. You know, you have, you have to be a 270 or bigger uh, or uh, with a 50 cal or bigger with a muzzle loader. And a minimum for a shotgun is a 20 gauge. Uh, you have to have that when it comes to firearms. Uh, anything under that makes it illegal. And you know, this might be the elk of your dreams, your lifetime. And it might be once in a lifetime opportunity. So you don't want to chance taking a smaller caliber out. And you know, we come out and have to seize the animal and your firearm uh, for you legally uh, taking the animal. And then as well as bait, um, just like bear and turkey, uh, in the state of Kentucky, you are not allowed to hunt elk over bait. Um, you know, you might have your deer feeder filled up. You might have a big bull coming in or a big cow coming in. You think, well, this is going to be a great opportunity. I'll be able to kill it. Either. But at that time, once there's bait on the ground, that area is baited. You can't hunt within that. And then if you forget that or you want to read up on it yourself, it's in page 18 in your hunting manual. It'll state, you know, elk may not be hunted over bait or or on private or uh, public land within the elk zones. So just remember, don't be in the area of any type of bait. Um, and then just, just a reminder here, um, whenever you do get your area, if it's RA or if it's your unit and your private property, public property, wherever you hunt at, just make sure you know uh, what modes of transportation uh, you're allowed to use on the property. Um, for example, some properties might, not, uh, might only allow foot traffic only. Some may allow vehicle traffic, some may allow ATV, some might prohibit uh, everything besides foot traffic. Uh, so, and some also may allow you to ride in on horseback. Just at the end of the day, you need to make sure it's on you as the hunter. One, to make sure you're in the right area. One, you're uh, hunting with the proper equipment. Two, you have permission to be there. And um, then as well as, you know, the, the equipment you're using. If you're using ATV, UTV, horseback, uh, you, you need to make sure that property and that property owner allows you to be there with that proper equipment. Um, and if, if you follow, I, I know we can't cover everything like Sergeant Spears said, but just some of these common violations, I mean, it's recurring every year. So if you just listen and look at some of these things we've stated, uh, I'm and sure you, you'll, you'll have a great experience out in the field. You know, I hope one of us actually will come out and check you, maybe even have a, a harvest of yourself where we can look at it. And at the end of the day, we're not there. We're not the bad people. Uh, we want to help you, and we want to see you uh, harvest the animal. Um, if there's nothing else, that's, that's all I have on the on the violations. I'll, I'll add some to the bait. Um, I, this is a common question I get is what's bait? And, and if you'll go to the KAR that he's going to include underneath um, 
it defines it as a means, a substance composed of grains, mineral salts, fruits, vegetables, hay, or any other food materials, whether natural or manufactured, that could lure, entice, or attract wildlife. And, and it goes into talking about how, you know, you, you know, if you're at a farm um, is exempt from that, you know, if they're doing a normal agricultural practice. But I tell you that because I get the question on, can I use like lure? Well, lure, you're baiting. Um, so go in there really, if you really want to know it, it's on the KAR, but really get in there and look. You can't use really anything there to attract it as far as bait. Now calling, perfectly legal. Um, there is some regulations on that to consider, but make sure you're, you know, doing it legally. Uh, another thing that I see, um, had a case on it last year, is you walk up and um, we had a gentleman to see a bull eating on somebody's deer feeder. Uh, he shoots the bull and he says, well, it wasn't my bait. Well, it baits bait. So whether you put it out, whether you're trying, he mentioned to, you know, just because it's a deer feeder, you can't hunt elk over. It doesn't matter. Bait's bait. Just remember that. Uh, can't use no lures. Can't use that bait. Um, if it's somebody else's bait, if you're if you're hunting and you walk up on a, a you know a giant corn pile, well, that area is going to be off limits for you. Um, I mean, whether you put it there or not, that's just something to consider. Um, just kind of wanted to touch on that. And uh, do y'all have anything to add to that part? We'll pass it on to Sergeant Pigman. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, reporting violations. So uh, uh, one of the things that you would want to do is uh, if you need to report a violation, you can go to the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife's website and you go under law enforcement and you can click on the county and it'll actually show you the officer in the county. It'll give you a cell phone number to him. So if you uh, need to contact that uh, officer in that county, you can go on our website and get that number. And that's not a bad idea to do a little uh, homework before you hit the field. Uh, if you're going to, particularly if you're going to work Lester County, which I'm the officer in Lester County, uh, look up my phone number, look up my information, stuff like that. Um, one thing I'll add about that also um, on the on the contact, um, you can uh, you can call our 1-800-25 alert number if you see something in the field that doesn't seem right or whatever, and uh, report that. Uh, that'll go to the state police. Uh, they actually dispatch for us, so they will alert us to a violation in the field and stuff. Um, if you see anything in the field that you think is out of place or you see four-wheelers, we're in eastern Kentucky, and you're, you know, very apt if you're, if you're hunting in a uh, hunter access area, you're going to see maybe some locals that are in there on ATVs and stuff. So, you know, if you want to call us about that, feel free to call us. Um, the department has a, uh, an app. It's called uh, KFW Law, and that is an anonymous tip. Yeah, you can actually do anonymous tip there and things like that if you want to do that. I want to add this too. You know, the officer in the county, uh, like Letcher County, so I know uh, RH Group property well. I know uh, Elkhorn Coal property well. So, you know, we're a good point of reference for you if you want to call us and talk to us about it. I, I mean, I've pretty well walked the boundaries of most all those lands. I know where they're at. So if you have a question about one of those pieces of property, so, you know, it's not as, I, I couldn't really tell you a lot about Floyd County or stuff like that because I'm not over there that much. But in Letcher County, you know, try to contact that officer in that county because he can be a real good source of information for you to, uh, to tell you about where the property is at. He can tell you where to park at. I mean, I can tell you where to park for RH Group property. There is going to be some gates at some of these properties. Uh, some places will be open, others will not be. So you'll, it'll be foot traffic only. You'll have to walk in there. But, uh, I want to encourage you to uh, look up your local conservation officer if you have a question about a, a particular area in your county. And like I said, most of our officers they're well versed to the to their community. They know uh, they know where all these tracts of land are at. Most of us have all walked them or been on them at some point. So we would be a good source for you to uh, to give us information about that or to, to ask us about information about that. And I just want to remind you too that uh, if you see anything in the field, if uh, if you know that you're the only hunter in that uh, hunter access area and you see another hunter there, uh, sometimes uh, things has happened. Uh, people have taken themselves out of, out of these zones and they've done it accidentally. Uh, and that happened a couple of years ago. And we actually on RH, we only had one hunter assigned to it and there two hunters showed up and it ended up being the original hunter. He clicked himself off the ab and, or he went on the ab and clicked himself off, the, off that site and someone else picked it up. And so I had two hunters up there. So, you know, feel free to call us. Uh, we, we have a number of officers spread out all over Eastern Kentucky, so uh, we're pretty pretty quick to get to you 
in, in those situations. Just bear with us because we're covering a pretty big area, but uh, we will get back with you and answer your question or, or show up there if there is a violation or something. But I want to encourage you if you if you see something you want to, like I said, if you want to do it anonymous, that's fine. Just send us a tip. Uh, more than likely, if you're in the field and you see a violation, you're going to be calling because you're out there elk hunting. So uh, we'll try to get there as quick as we can and handle the situation. Uh, something I would add to that is, is um, kind of ranking on the you went over um, the how to report the violations. Uh, like if you need an officer immediately, uh, your quickest option is going to be calling the local Kentucky State Police Post or the 1-800-25-ALERT. It's going to be a little quicker. And what they'll do is they will get you the officer, whether it's outside of his county, if you need somebody immediately, they will put you in touch with an officer that is working right then. So if you just want to talk, like if it did, like maybe it's a day you're just wanting to talk about boundaries or where to park, as Sergeant Pigman talked about, uh, that find my county contacts a good option. That way you're talking to the guy that knows the area. Uh, but if he's not working, you know, he'll get back with you. We, our officer's really good about that. Probably the slowest would be the KFW law app because it goes through a, a, you know, it goes to somebody and they have to, you know, divert where they're going. But the good thing about that one is if you don't, if you want to be anonymous, you, you don't want nobody to know who you are. We would, we never would tell nobody. If somebody wants to stay anonymous, they stay anonymous. But the good thing about that app is, is we don't know who, who reports it. So um, if you want to stay anonymous, but it's probably going to be the slowest of the options. I'll finish up. Just remember, guys, if you do report something, we are out here in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, so if even if unless that we they holler at us on the radio, if they try to send us an email, we might not have service. So it might take just a little bit longer for us to get back to you, but we will get back with you. And if we have to respond to you, it might take a slow time because we have a lot of acres around here that we have to cover. Um, just don't give up on us. We will be there or we will give you a call back. All righty, guys. Well, uh, this has been pretty interesting for me. Um, you've cleared up some of the questions I had, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's going to be very helpful to all of our elk hunters. Is there any uh, – you guys have any closing thoughts or any any last last points that you want to, to drive home, make sure that our, our elk hunters know before they take to the field? No, I, I'll touch on the, what my intro was. Just remember, we can't cover everything. Uh, just, just open up the hunting guide. Link will be here. Uh, go to the KARs, read those, just, just be familiar with the area. Uh, that's, that's one of the big common things is just not knowing, you know, not knowing where you're going to be. So be familiar with the area, be familiar with your equipment, uh, follow these, what we've discussed and even take it a step further and read the hunting guide and, and you should have a good hunt. And I'm, I'm confident you'll be successful. All right, guys. Well, thank you again for, uh, for, for joining us. Um, and, uh, I guess I, I should go ahead and remind the hunters that are watching this to, uh, uh, check for next week's episode. I think we're going to do kind of a, a bag or gear type dump. And then, uh, as soon as John gets back, I believe we're going to start to transition to more, uh, you know, real hunting themed conversations. Um, we're going to look at some habitat use. I think that'll be the next one after he comes back. And then, uh, maybe some uh scenarios hunt scenarios calling stuff like that but uh i'll probably get uh get scolded if i don't remind you to subscribe to the department's youtube page and uh, click the little bell icon to get alerts when new videos pop up but uh i think uh i think that's about it for today again uh thank you guys very very much for everything that you all do for for the sportsmen women of the state and um as always, here's the contact information for all of the people that were part of this uh, webinar today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.